Всем привет, меня зовут Матиас. Я работаю в компании JetBrains. И я рад быть здесь во второй раз. Извините, пожалуйста, сегодня я немного болен. Ну, так дальше по-английски. Um, so my topic today is build automation. Uh, the first question from, from me to you is uh, how many have been, how many of you heard about Nuke before, maybe seen the first talk or have used it? So at least like three people. Okay, cool. Uh, we'll still make a little introduction. So what is build automation in general? And this picture shows it, illustrates it quite, quite nicely, taken from Cradle. Uh, build automation can be quite complex, and in general, it's the, it's the process of putting all the different tasks that are related to software development, deployment, uh, into an automated process. So the bigger goal behind this is also to eliminate the chance of human error. Everything that is possible to be automated, maybe even the impossible things, uh, should be automated, because otherwise we might deal with human error. There are a couple of options already for build automation. And looking at the .NET ecosystem, I would say those are the most mature ones. The first row are, is, or are the XML-based uh, build system, like MS Build and NAND. I know in MS Build you can also implement certain things uh, in, in task assemblies, but generally it's driven from XML. In the second row are all the build systems that are not related to C Sharp. Uh, so fake for F Sharp, Pisaki, I think it's pronounced, uh, for PowerShell, Rake for Ruby, and Gradle. Actually, I, I need to mention this as well because I'm using that for the um, ReSharp plug, uh, sample plugin that I'm maintaining. And so Gradle as well, which is used in, in the JVM area mostly, and Cake. Cake uh, is also based on C-sharp, um, but a little bit following more the scripting ap approach. So question here, who has used anything from the second row? Okay, the third row, so basically Cake. Okay, also quite, quite a few. Okay, uh, one question that I get many times is, okay, why do, we build, uh, why do we need build systems? Because we have CI servers, right? Like, I need to say Team City first, um, MyGet, Azure DevOps, and so on. You can name them. Um, however, if you only rely on CI servers, it might occur that you're facing something like this. Uh, you're committing just a lot of uh, new changes and you're waiting for the CI server to complete to finally diagnose a certain certain thing. Another issue with build uh, servers is that yeah, the, the, this change feedback cycle is quite long. So especially in a team, um, when you only have a few on-premise agents, you might also occupy that with, with some more important things that should run. Um, also, you exp can experience some kind of uh, lock-in uh, situation when you configure your build with, let's say, um, AppVayer and you want to switch to Travis. It might be that not all the tasks that you've used with, uh, what did I name first, AppVayer, um, that they are not existent on Travis CI, for instance. Right, uh, another thing, s some are supporting that, but not all is versioning. Sometimes our repository structure also depends, or the build, build script depends on the repository structure. And if we can't have that in Zync, then maybe some branch will always fail, or maybe the master will fail, and so on. So my general message, uh, independent of what I will be talking today, is use build systems uh, to build everywhere, but also use CI servers. Why? Um, because from my experience, CI servers also have the benefit to gather historical data, for instance, like execution times of tests, also generating some nice charts from that. 
Um, assigning investigations, for instance, if someone broke the builds, you can just blame them. You can also implement those nice traffic lights right in your, um, in your, in your office. Um, and what else? Yeah, par parallelization, uh, especially in terms of hardware parallelization, because you can have multiple agents, um, real machines, actual machines. Um, build systems are usually not, uh, do not have that in scope, usually, from what I know. Okay, another common response is, why do we need a build system? We have .NET Core CLI, right? .NET Core CLI has a lot of built-in um, commands. I think it's also ex extensible to some degree. Um, so you can build, publish, restore, uh, pack, push, and so on. A lot of stuff, test also. Um, but there's an interesting book which says it depends. It's one of my favorites. It's so famous that it got translated into Russian also. Um, and, and here's an example which is actually taken from the Rosson repository. Um, especially, let's see how this works. Oh yeah, great. Especially, I should have used the magnifier, especially this build.ps1 and build.sh file, the PowerShell and bash files, they're quite large and to some degree they're also duplicated. You also see this build stuff um, has a lot of different languages uh, incorporated, like beside bash and, and PowerShell, it had it has also XML, and there's some uh, MS Build uh, XML too, and there are a couple of others too, maybe inside the directories. So it's very cluttered in general. Okay, so that's how I wanted to motivate why I speak about Nuke today as a modern build system uh, for C Sharp uh, developers. First, before, before we dive into the actual uh, stuff, I want to point out some of the recent achievements which, uh, achievements which I have been very proud of. The first one, well, actually, I should have mentioned the first appearance on, on the Dot .next uh, conference, but later on, it was in November 2018 when we had an episode with .NET Rocks. Um, in December 2018, uh, Nuke got merged as the build system for Avalonia UI, so you can also bother with uh, Nikita and ask him how he likes it. M or maybe not, because my latest PR got a little bit stale. Um, anyway, in January 2019, uh, we achieved featured parity for all the extensions that we provide, especially Visual Studio was, was missing, this guy here. Um, Feature parity means those extensions provide a nice way to execute certain targets right from inside the IDE. You don't need to switch to the console. And also to write new, ta uh, new targets more conveniently. And the latest one was in March 2019, an episode with Jamie Taylor on the .NET uh, Core Show. Okay, so now we can dive into advantages and build automation. I love to call it like that. Um, the first few things are setup and bootstrapping. This is an example taken from some of my colleagues who were talking about how, how great it is used in, in production. And it seems, I'm not a professional at all, um, but it seems that it's a convenient method to just copy one greater folder to the other um, some other answers also included this helper website. Um, well, you need internet for that, but uh, you basically configure a few parameters and then you can download the stuff that you extract into your um, repository. Not the greatest way, if you ask me. Um, with Nuke, the only thing you will ever do as a, as a first-time experience is ins installing a global tool. Who has no idea what, what a global tour is? No, oh, a few. So a global tour is like installing a certain executable that is available from all other places, speaking of 
um, folder locations where you can be, and you can just call a command that is called nuke. So it behaves like the echo command, for instance, or wh whatever. So after you have done that, if you go to a certain project, then what you can do is call nuke clone setup. And this setup will guide you through a bunch of certain steps to c make a basic configuration for your new project. The first question would be, how should the build project be named? Well, the default is underscore build, um, because I like to have it at the top in my solution uh, file to, uh, to be placed at the top, not somewhere in between, so with an with a underscore pr uh, prefix. Um, the actual location, however, inside is just a subfolder called build. And then I, th I think that's the nice part because you got to choose which version you want to rely on. And also note that it has this, this the second entry uh, which says latest local. So if you're on the plane and you already have a project built with Nuke, then you will at least get the local version and you can restore from your, from your Nuke package cache. Um, if there are pre-releases, they, um, they will be mentioned as well. And last question, uh, which solution should be the default? If you don't have a default solution in your repository, then you just choose none. If you can't name a single solution that is like the main entry point. But if you have one, then choosing this default uh, solution will make two things. It will add the build project to the solution automatically and it will also make the default build implementation that you get generated, um, compiling that default solution. So, and I also have some kind of continuing uh, wizard that helps you and you can answer more questions, but let's just say no. Okay. The applied changes in that case, because it's interesting what has happened to our repository. Um, the first thing is there will be a file added with .nuke. That is basically just to have a marker for the root folder of the project, which is nearly always the .git uh, folder that you also have if you use git or .svn. Um, second, of course, there's a build project, which is just a console application. That's the, the new thing, I guess, uh, about Nuke co compared to other build systems. Then, of course, the default build implementation, um, the build PS1 and build SH files, they are basically just used to bootstrap the console application. And by bootstrapping, I mean not only calling .NET Run, but also um, downloading the .NET Core SDK if it's not available, even if the, the version doesn't match. So generally you could, if you're at your, I don't know, family, you really need to fix something quickly. You, can, you don't really need to download the SDK, it gets done for you. And the last two files, um, editor config and dot settings, they are used for the formatting tweaks um, for, for Visual Studio and ReSharper based uh, products, ReSharper and Writer. Um, and la last but not least, solution file, I I've named that already, depending if you're choosing a default solution or not. So um, the hello world example, that is, one thing where I do a quick demonstration. Let's see. And of course, I forgot to delete that. So, so like I said before, just calling, oh, that should, shouldn't have happened. Ah, it didn't delete the files, right. Now, okay, nuke. And there's no .nuke file, so it will ask, do you want to set up? I say yes, and basically I'm just continuing through. 
In this case, because I just had to merge something for this presentation, um, I will use the pre-release and also add it to the, to the solution file. Let's see, I had it added before, so maybe there it is now twice, no. But afterwards, you will see that in your solution, like here. And now speaking of, of Hello World, I can just, let's say, go to compile and write hello. Or the more nuke way would be to use the logger and say hello. Let's use world now. And now when I execute that, not this time, oh, log, ah, yeah, this should be like normal level, sorry. It isn't a live demo if not something goes wrong. Yeah. Ah. I think the zooming doesn't work so well. So now you see there's hello world. Uh, it's small, but it's there. Um, okay. Let's go back to the presentation. And I want to point out a few things here. The first is dependency management. As I mentioned, this is just a normal console application. This instead, dependency management in Cake, is done with preprocessor directives, and the actual information is hidden way here behind. Cake Gitter, Cake Twitter, and then the version behind. And also, as, as far as I know, there's no way to automatically update that or manage that in any way. So my general reaction was more like, okay, you can do that, um, but it could be better. Um, the second one is unknow uh, unknown unknowns. That is especially a problem uh, speaking of build systems based on other languages, not C-sharp languages. I'm not an expert in PowerShell, but during the time I had to use it, there was a bunch of stuff that was really surprising if you, if you hit, hit them as, a, as an issue. Especially I remember this one, why does PowerShell silently convert a string array with one item to a string? Really great, or a very simple one, how do I concatenate strings and variables in PowerShell? Well, it's obvious, I guess, for everyone how this is done in C Sharp. Um, if you go to another language, it can be annoying. And especially don't forget, if you're working in a team, everyone is responsible for the build, then maybe every now and then, people will hit that issues over time again and again. The last one is also nice. Demystified, now comparison, great. Um, yeah. Targets as strings. Um, we haven't looked at that yet, um, but remember there's, in Cake, you have them as strings, in, I think that was cake, you have them as strings. In MS Build, you have them as strings anyways. Um, and, no, let, let, let's stay here. When you execute that and you have a typo somewhere, my last example was <laughs> initialization with S or Z. Both is correct, but it could, could be overlooked quite easily. Then at runtime, you, you, get the, you get the full power uh, in your face. Um, let's switch back to Nuke for this, um, and I like to ma make a small quiz of that. You see that target clean, right? What do you think is clean in terms of a member? Is it a class? Yeah. No. I mean, in terms of a construct in the C-sharp language. What is it? Hmm? It is, no, it's not a function. I, I mean, in terms of, is it a field, struct, field? No. No. Huh? Property, right. Um, it's a property, so let's see. 
the property, the type is target, and target is actually a delegate. And the first arrow indicates it's, a, it's an expression bodied property. And what's returned afterwards is just a delegate. So with uh, input parameter, and that's the output. So this is why this looks a bit fancy. Uh, people are constantly complaining about that. Um, so I made it available to, for them to customize that, but I don't support it anymore. Um, yeah, so let's go back. And the third thing, debugging experience. Um, if you have ever worked with fake or cake, I used here as an example. There are articles uh, that will explain you how debugging works in general. Um, the funny thing is also for cake, uh, there are a bunch of them. One is for Visual Studio, the other is for Visual Studio Code. I think in, in Rider it's not possible. Um, as of now, and you have to read a lot of stuff, even for the just normal things. And if we try to do that in, in Nuke, the only thing you do is hitting a breakpoint, and from Rider you can call uh, Alt Enter, and then say, I want to debug that, and it gets compiled. Let's see and the breakpoint is hit. That, that's all. And you can also inspect certain things. And this time, th this is optimized. That, that, uh, that is why it's not available. If I would use a configuration, then you, then you could inspect that, actually. OK. So what's next? Um, what we have added recently, too, or extended, is the dependency model. This is one example of a more comprehensive uh, build implementation, which basically says, okay, there's a, there's a compile target, and I have unit tests and integration tests, which depend on compile. Tests will just summarize them. Publish should uh, actually execute tests, pack, inspect, and so on. And now there are two things left. First are those uh, dashed lines, and second, this very thick um, yellow line. The explanation behind that is, if you want to execute compile, it doesn't really, it doesn't really depend on clean, but if clean is executed with compile, then it should be scheduled before compile, because you can compile, sure. You don't always want to clean, clean the artifacts. Uh, maybe you want to, I don't know, have a faster build. So you can decide uh, if you want to do that. Instead, if you have publish, that will really depend on clean. Um, also, clean is scheduled before inspect. And the other thing is publish triggers announce. This is like an inverse uh, declaration of dependency so to say, because if you have this graph and you would make this is a dependency, then you would just call, okay, announce, but this is very little expressive, at least that's how I think. Instead, it's more useful to say, okay, I want to call publish, and that triggers the announce target. Okay, uh, and here's how you do that. Um, normal dependencies, well, that's straightforward. You can just use this fluent syntax that is initialized with that delegate that I mentioned earlier, and you can call depends on and depends on and so on. The second one are those that are ordering uh, dependencies. Oh yeah, I, sometimes I switch the name. Sometimes I say schedule dependencies, but whatever. Um, those are de defined either with dot before uh, with a before call or after, depending on which side you you want to um, you want to declare it. Um, here's another thing: skip behavior, because tests is dependent on unit tests and integration tests. But let's say we skip tests. Should unit tests and integration tests still be executed? Well, in this case, not right. But sometimes, if we express such dependencies, we still want the, de the dependencies to be executed. 
just sometimes. I, I know it exists. Um, but here in this example, the only thing we do is say, when it's skipped, then also skip the dependencies. And last example is with the uh, triggered um, target, just say uh, triggered by. And mind here, instead of declaring for the announced target to be triggered by publish, we could also go to the publish um, target and say it triggers announce. So you can always, for all of those uh, dependencies, you can make it either on the first target or the second. There are always two counterpart methods to declare the individual dependency, which is important for later. Um, okay, another uh, build automation adventure. That's also from the Roslyn repository, and you see on the left side, it's the same script actually, on the left, on the right. And you see here uh, are a bunch of parameters defined, and on the right-hand side, that is the help text that it's printed if you call, I don't know, slash question mark or something. But it's obvious, this, this kind of violates the locality and, and you might forget to update one of these and I, I, I thought it could, could get better. Um, oh, sorry, let's go back. So this is the second uh, example I want to show you live. Demo params. Ah. Import static. Okay. So here we have a bunch of parameters defined just with, with an attribute of various types actually also. So verbosity. Verbosity is an enum. Absolute path instead is, is an actual class. And now if I go here and call, let's see, new minus minus help. Uh, mistake, let's see, compile, ah, yeah, okay. Let's say we have demo params like this, okay. Now you see that those parameters, oh, come on, are also included in the help text automatically because it's easy to analyze with, uh, with reflection. Um, we have the description over there, plus, and uh, that was quite interesting to implement. If we now want to call, or if we now want to pass such um, parameters, we can just use auto-completion. So for instance, for string, I type str, tap, and it will complete to string. So let's say hello. Uh, we also have a number. No, my favorite number. Um, verbosity, which I mentioned was an enum, can get completed to normal. And local path, uh, we will also look at this in a moment, but we can pass, for instance, the path to the build PowerShell file. So let's do this with build.ps1. Those are ju just a couple of examples. And you see everything has been passed more or less correctly. Local path gets expanded to an absolute path. That, that is the idea behind this absolute path type. Um, so that you don't run into, into problems with relative paths or anything. Um, okay, another thing in terms of parameters is also, when did I start? Half past, right? Yes. Um, another thing, let's introduce a new one. Um, uh, let's skip the description. Um, arrays, sometimes we need to pass arrays, right? array string and in this case well just join with commas or comma comma separated and i'm honest with you uh, completion doesn't work until i either execute nuke one time or call the uh, dash dash help because we need to inve uh, investigate the assembly first 
Um, so I will do this just manually and I say array minus string and then I can say A, B, C, D and so on. And it will have those various commas separated. Now I want to make this a little, a little more interesting. Let's say we have another target. The, this is by the way the snippet that I was spe uh, speaking of. So you can just say end target in all the, with all the major IDE extensions and then give it a name. Okay. And let's say this target is taking quite long, um, like five seconds. And we also make it um, is depend, um, dependent for, so that, that's what I meant. We can also reverse how we define dependencies for the demo params. Now, I will remove calling or passing this, this parameter. And what you will see is foo is taking quite long. It could be like forever. And then we find out, okay, value cannot be null because we, the, this, this call is not gu guided for null values, this, this one here, right? Let's assume this is another case, for instance, with an API key for pushing, for pushing NuGet packages to a certain uh, source. And the way how you can do this in Nuke, just to express that this certain target depends on an actual value for a parameter, is you just say it requires, and then lambda, um, what was it, string array. Where string array, uh, array string. And now let's do this again. As a, for practicing. Okay, Lo locally it will ask you to provide a value on the fly, more or less. Um, if, however, you are on Team City, for instance, then let's see what happens. It will fast fail the build. This is basically what we want. Okay, so that was it for build parameters. Path construction is also an, a nice topic. Still in MS Build, I think this open indicator is still actual. I took the picture like one week ago. And as far as I know, especially the last item for exact tasks, um, it's still an issue to have proper encapsulation of um, path sep separators, whether you're on Windows systems or Unix systems. Um, I know I have a slide for that. Sorry, I forgot. I forgot. Uh, in Nuke, it's just written this way. So, for instance, you have an absolute path over here, and you can return root directory. That's the place where the .nuke file is, and then we're miss. No, we're not misusing it. We're making use of the division operator, um, and diving into a subdirectory in this case called uh, output or source. Sometimes you might want to also have relative paths. In this case, you need this little cast right here at the, at the start, unfortunately. And sometimes also you might want to have, even if, if you're on a Unix system, you might want to have a Windows uh, path separated um, string. Then you can also just cast them. This is also a great uh, example for command line tool invocations. Usually there's a lot of use of third-party um, command line tools and build scripts. Um, this is again from, from my Gradle build that I maintain for the Resharper plugins. And yeah, you see it's dependent on Windows or, or Unix. Then you have this nice way how to pass arguments and so on. And, and I always forget, okay, yeah, you need a comma between them. Yeah, whatever. It doesn't look so great, uh, in my opinion. This is the way how you do it in Nuke. Um, for instance, calling the .NET CLI with the build command. Um, this is, th those are just some pictures taken from Rider 2. 
So you hit DNB as a capital uh, letter completion. You complete, and you see you also get this summary, which is basically the same summary which is on the official documentation. So if you I, I like this, this use case. You're on the flight, and you don't have internet. You don't need it. It's there. Um, OK. Continuing, if you further want to customize that, uh, by the way, calling just that, we'll just call .NET build, that's all. If you further want to uh, modify the, com the arguments that are passed, then you start that with a, um, with a delegate. And so in this case, we want to pass the project file, for instance, and you see there are a bunch of uh, auto-completion items, how to further modify that. And in this case, of course, it makes sense to use it makes sense to use the set project file method and pass the solution, for instance. Then another example, this, this is just based on a Boolean, right? We can either say no restore flag, yes or no. Um, you can either set this, so the, the, this circle is way too big. Um, but you can also say reset or enable, disable, or toggle the actually uh, current value for that. And third example for verbosity, verbosity accepts a definite set of values. So in this case, you have auto-completion also for the different values that it accepts. And it's also worth to point out, well, e even the, um, the modification uh, methods have the summary built into uh, for, for the quick documentation. And here's a quick glance at how this is implemented in general. I mean, th th those methods that we have here, they, they are not handmade or something. They're actually generated based on this information. This is just for the few methods that I have shown you, like the project file, configuration, uh, configuration not, but anywhere I have it here, and no restore. And you see, for instance, project file is of type string. Uh, the format is just passing the value instead of for configuration, it's minus minus configuration and then the value uh, plus the help text and for no restore, this is of type bool um, and the help text. This tool specification also supports lists, dictionaries and uh, lookup tables. So for if you have a one-to-many mapping. Okay. This is also how you can provide those implementations for one of your tools, if you have a custom tool in your company or something. And the usual response for people that I told about that was, I have no time for that to, to learn how all this is done with the tool specification. So we came up with this. Um, the lightweight resolution, which should at least help you to to find the path to your executable more easily. The first example, path executable, is almost self-explanatory. Well, everything should be self-explanatory, but I still want, uh, will explain it. Path executable is just everything that is also available from your comment line, so through the path environment variable. Local executable uh, are those that are part of your repository. It should be avoided in general, but sometimes it's it's Un unavoidable, and package executable is a nice way to resolve executables from um, NuGet packages that are as, that are defined as dependencies for your build project. So in this case, those tools of type tool, it's a delegate again, and they can be called just like that. For instance, with Git, um, we can make use of string interpolation and easily pass the arguments. Um, this method also accepts a bunch of optional parameters like working directory, um, timeout, environment variables, and so on. So it's in general a nice way to, to call um, certain command line tools. So in general, the, the reaction would be, why do I need tool specifications anyway? If it, String interpolation looks way nicer. And that's true with a few exceptions. Um, 
the Fluent API is, is still the reason. Um, this example was motivated from uh, after I reviewed the new implementation Nikita did, did inside Avalonia UI. In this case, we conditionally modify the set logger and result directory value. So you can do even if conditions fluently uh, with that call. And it's just one example. A second example. Oh, by the way, um, I'm looking at, at my, my personal feeling is that I'm looking at um, build implementation nearly in the same way as with test code. And test code should also not be conditional or a lot of uh, while loops and so on. Um, so, so this is my preferred way. And we'll get even more obvious with the next example. Um, imagine you have a solution and this solution has X projects and all those proje projects should be published for different uh, runtimes plus for different frameworks too. This is how you do it in Nuke. Well, usually in other frameworks you would need to make at least three, four eaches or something. Um, but here you just uh, create the published combinations first and we're iterating over the projects then over the corresponding target frameworks. And note, this is even takes into account that they have different target frameworks. And then finally making the product with uh, the runtimes. And afterwards we just say, okay, combine this with the published combinations pass the values and moreover have a de degree of parallelism of five. Um, sometimes this improves performance quite well. So um, MS build is, is really, seems to be really nice under the hood uh, in terms of building. A second example for this combine with way, um, pushing NuGet packages. In this case, we're gathering all the NuGet packages from our output directory. And in addition to a degree of parallelism of five, we also say, even if one is failing, we want to continue. This is very helpful to, um, in case NuGet aborts um, pushing or is un uh, unavailable or something. Previously, I had to rewrite my build script, execute it again, because it was not uh, built for such cases. But here it's quite easy. Okay, and last, um, last topic will be build sharing. And you see there are three answers. Well, let, let me motivate first. If you're maintaining a bunch of projects uh, which are very similar to each other, then you might run into the situation where you say, okay, I want to share the build. They are almost identical. I have my, my standards. How can I share build implementation across those projects? Any ideas? Hmm? Louder. I can't hear you. NuGet packages, that's in <laughs> Git. Okay, then we have two, two answers already. Git repository is one, right, with submodules. So we still have a third one. And I'm, I'm telling you it's this guy here. So probably you know what happens in the third picture. So what is the way of build sharing? The easy way of build sharing. Copy paste. Right, submodules, NuGet packages, copy paste. Right. Beside those, um, we came up with two additional approaches. And those two additional approaches are actually driven from the community also. So, uh, or in general, I have to say, many, many of the stuff that was here, I mentioned it also with the example with Nikita. Um, are driven from people using it and they come and ask, okay, how, how can we do this better in a, in a better way? The first one are global tools. And I've mentioned that we have this built CS project file first. And 
the additional thing here is this pack as tool true and the tool command name build. What does that do? If we pack this build project, then it will be available to be installed just like the, the new global tool. And so if you're part of the core development team and all of your, um, you know, let's say, um, more, how to say, um, other teams which depend on the core development team, and they are not dealing with the build, but, but you're as the core development team, um, uh, take care, uh, you take care of the build, uh, then you can give them just that NuGet package, they install that, and then they just call build as a command, and that's all. Um, they can't really change it, but the big advantage here is you see that we are depending on a bunch of third-party tools like Git version, uh, resharper command lines, open cover, and so on. They, they, might, they might not have those packages locally installed on their machines. What Nuke extends uh, .NET Pack here, uh, how Nuke extends .NET Pack here, is that it will automatically push the, um, or, or pack uh, the executables inside that build NuGet package. And so we, we have all the executables here, um, which are matching just the ones on the left-hand side. So and if you install that, the, those executables get automatically resolved from inside the NuGet package very easily. The second example are external files. Um, on the left-hand side, we have a template file, let's say. That's why I named it .tmp. And we see we have a target um, implementation which calls msbuild and .NET restore. And the first part should be for projects that rely on msbuild, the second for those that can, use, that can make use of .NET uh, CLI. Might depend on, on the project as well, but this is how you can configure that. So the first part, you have the comments right here, is used if you want to use msbuild, second for .NET CLI. Plus, um, there's a source parameter which uh, has the underscore source URL assigned. Now, if you want to use that implementation into, inside one of your projects, all you need to do is create a build.cs.ext file. Um, actually, just the first uh, extension matters, so you can uh, download whatever you want. But basically, it says, when this file is downloaded from this URL, then the .ext extension gets removed. It will automatically be downloaded according to some properties here. In this case, we choose um, .NET, so the second way, and define NuGet source as, yeah, this NuGet source, this string. And if we call nuke to build it, then this will be the outcome. So we have the .NET way, .NET CLI way, and also the string assigned. Well, more on the right, but time, uh, space is precious. And this will be done during execution of the build. So you don't really need to care, is it, uh, is it or you don't need to, um, in comparison to submodules, for instance, you don't really need to make another commit to say, okay, I want to raise the revision. Um, it had, happens automatically. Just to uh, make a quick comparison between those um, submodules, yeah, supports versioning. Extensibility is a bit difficult. Um, maintenance impact is more or less normal. Um, build extensibility is pretty interesting for NuGet packages and external files because in NuGet packages you can make use of inheritance, um, whereas in external files you can make use of partial declarations. And here is the thing why I said it's, it's um, important to have those counterparts of methods to say depends on and dependent for 
versus and uh, before after because if you have one file that is a template then you can't change it but on the partial file that you have beside that you can just say okay I want to schedule this even before the restore step or something um, global tools are not extensible but yeah it depends on the needs um, maintenance impact high and you can also version that yes okay what's next um, for the project more or less I got this request for running targets in parallel my answer was to have 500 stars on github meanwhile we are beyond 400 um, yeah that's great um, Another milestone is, of course, to get invited to more conferences. <laughs> Last time I applied for the build conference, but got re rejected, which is quite surprising. Um, technology radar would be great, um, but that's just a dream. And .NET Foundation is also a dream. I, I haven't had any chance to talk to John yet. Um, summarizing. Nuke as a whole is built with a focus on simplicity as a feature. At the same time, it's not mentioned here. Um, I'm, I'm very keen to know how the community thinks about certain things and to solve new problems that people tell me. The second thing is full IDE integration. By the way, I forgot something. I, I really need to show that. Let's see, demo targets, because that took a lot of time. I'm totally not the JavaScript type of guy. But let's see. The, this is the implementation that I've shown you earlier with that dependency model and so on. So. However you define your build, you can generate a live HTML graph from that. Now the default target is highlighted, but you can also navigate around and see what targets are actually executed, depending on what you invoke. But you can also invoke, for instance, tests and pack. You just separate them uh, with a white space. Okay, let's go back to the slides. Uh, slides. Full ID integration. Um, has been achieved. Flexible depend dependency model. Um, nothing to say about that, I think. Powerful parameter uh, resolution. It's also quite easy to do the, this uh, yourself. Uh, so if you have a custom type, you, can, you just need to put an attribute on it and provide some methods to make the conversion, which then gets called from Nuke. Light and strong tool integration, depending on your needs, uh, as I said before, especially if you want to have more conditional code with command line invocations or parallelism. And of course, the last thing that I've shown, uh, that, I, that I've shown, um, build sharing strategies, maybe there will come a couple of more, depending on the feedback. But yeah, Spasibo Zafnimanya. <laughs> Вопрос. Вопросы, да. Есть ли вопросы? Поднимайте руки. Okay. Uh, the question is, uh, when you package your code for build uh, as a Nougat package, mm -hmm. uh, does that mean that later uh, the team that uses this code for build, they will have to uh, create their own build project for their solution. No. What What do they type in then uh, to achieve the build uh, capability? For it their depends project? on. In this case, they would just call build. That's all. So, just just like that. Dot net build, or just not dot net build. Just build. Just build. Yeah. That's super. It behaves like the nuke global global tool. Um, 
The only thing, as far as I remember, which I forgot to mention, is you need that uh, .nuke file as a marker for the root directory so that the rest of the implementation works. But you don't need the build project because that is compiled already inside that NuGet package. But you can actually also, uh, that ne needs some, some more information, um, you don't necessarily need the .NET, uh, the .nuke uh, file, you can also pass a uh, parameter minus minus root, which would use the current uh, directory as the root directory, or you can just pass the value. So you have three options there, actually. Okay, so j they just open the console and uh, they uh, do like, uh, where do they add uh, the dependency to the NuGet package? Where do they add it? Uh, so that they, they don't add an, um, it's done the way like I've shown with, let's see. Where is it here? Like this, you call it .NET tool install, then the, in this case it was underscore build, um, underscore build, minus minus global, and that would make the build implementation available locally everywhere. And they will have to use the name of the uh, um, library that, or, or the NuGet package that they create, that we created. Yeah, the global package right here. Mm, what do you mean? Well, uh, oh, they will just have to uh, run. Just this. install, and afterwards, it's just typing build, yeah, and that's sure. all. Okay. And they can still pass parameters and everything, um, but they have limited access, let's say, to the build implementation. They can't extend it. Okay. Yeah? Hi, thank you for the talk. Uh, just to make clear, so if uh, we want to make specific builds for every project, for example, and uh, so we need to make uh, this build project, uh, for example, uh, as the additional. And uh, we, when we want to deploy, we can use uh, the console application, uh, which may- I'm Sorry, in, in which context? For build uh, sharing? No, uh, just uh, when we want to deploy every mm -hmm. project uh, separate. Separately, Separately yeah. Fr yes. from your solution. Yes. Yeah. So just another project and uh, mm -hmm. deploy system size server or something, just have to execute that console application, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. That was the question, thank you. No questions anymore? Okay, then thanks again for your attention. <laughs>